Do you notice I sang that a little low this today? Yeah, it was a little low. It's great when you have allergies, you know, you can yeah, you, know, you can hit those low notes. <laughs> uh, you guys couldn't hit those low notes, huh? No. <laughs> Sorry. I thought, man, I hit the key of G and I went, oh, that might be a little low. So sorry about that. Hey, we're in Mark 13. Um, We're going to be, hey, Chuck and Marl, how are you guys doing? Good to see you. Looks like you're just surviving there, Chuck. Long day? Yeah. I'll try not to bore you too bad. Uh, I... uh, because of some of the subject matter we will be covering, I'm, I'm, I'm going to really try to take things slow, but I, I want to start connecting passages and things that, that um, are fascinating to think about that you don't normally hear a lot about unless you're at a seminar or you know at something that's specifically a prophecy conference kind of thing. And I just really want to encourage you to just, uh, instead of trying to catch up or whatever, there's going to be a couple of places where I may read a passage and have you watch the video screen just as I'm talking about certain things. But then there'll be certain passages you're welcome to turn to or just to write out and look up for yourself. Because what I have found is that when I'm getting ready to teach something, I'm not like, like, oh boy, what can I teach those people? I'm like, what am I going to learn to be able to give what I have learned? And the same thing will happen to you when you take this stuff and you go study it for yourself. You know what happens? You want to go share it. You just want to go share it. Isn't that right, Kathy? I mean, Harv, right? When you kind of have it in your heart, and when it's not in your heart, you tend not to share. Isn't that true? But when it's in your heart, you're like, oh, man, I got to tell you this thing. You know, Greg, you're you're famous for that, man. I mean, I just love Greg because usually he comes to first service. He'll come up and he'll just give me this little insight. It's like, dude, that was so good. I'm going to use that second service, you know, because I can tell he studies the word. And a lot of you guys do that. But what I'm going to do tonight is we're we're. We're talking about something that is foretold, something that Jesus is telling us. It's the Olivet Discourse as he's giving a sermon in regards to the signs of two events, the temple's destruction, uh, which is going to lead to man's dilution of the gospel and then into the Great Tribulation. So there's a lot of time. There's a lot of spread there. Great tribulation hasn't happened. The tribulation period has not happened yet. So we're still kind of in this mode. Some of this is fulfilled. Some of of it is not. But last week we kind of talked about how many books have tried to predict the end, the Lord's return. And we talked about some of those particular things. Now, when I talk about many of these books, I'm not putting them down and I'm not putting the authors down. I'm just simply saying we need to be careful about all the books that talk about end time prophecy because a lot of times they have dates or they have months or there's some sort of, you know, we all have our guesses and and I think it's good. I think it's important for us to, to look for those things. But Jesus didn't tell us to study the signs. He told us to study the sun, to look to him. The signs are to get us excited about the sun. The signs aren't meant for us to get down so we can say we know before you do kind of thing. And we saw that many books have tried to predict that most recently, you know, the blood red moons and uh, the Shemitah. And now it's Revelation chapter 12 is a new thing. The woman, the dragon and the child. Have you guys heard this one? Okay, this is something you'll probably see as. We get closer to September because that's the date, okay? Uh, There's going to be, and this is true scientifically, there's going to be a U.S. solar eclipse this coming August, and it starts in Oregon. It's going to start in Oregon. And ironically, at that time, the, the planet Venus is going to be shining brightly. 
And it's important that we study the signs in the heavens and all that. I'm not, again, but the whole concept is, is that there's going to be an alignment in the heavens. If you study the stars, Revelation 12, 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. And the theory is that the alignment of these 12 stars will indicate the rapture of the church, the great tribulation, or the abomination of desolation, whichever one you want to choose kind of thing. What's going to happen when this takes place? And so there's a, there's a ton of truth in it. And again, I don't want to mock uh, the, the reality of what's going on in the stars or the reality of what's going on in the heavens or the reality of what we're facing on our earth because I think we all feel we're in the last days. I think we can all feel that. It's like, man, but you know, to be honest, I bet you they felt like they were in the last days during World War II. See, so the thing is, I think it's important. I don't want to become cynical of end times because the Bible says don't become a mocker. There'll be mockers in the last days and I don't want to be among those. I want to be uh, focused on that. But anyway, uh, here's one of the responses there's this uh video on youtube about this revelation 12 by a guy named clark and here was one of the responses and this is why it gets a little goofy when people start using stuff in the bible to create up their own scenario this, this is one of the responses on the youtube it says the eclipse is exactly seven months after trump's first day in office where he was 70 years, seven months, and seven days old. Okay? And the Revelation 12 sign is 33 days after the eclipse. So, you see where this goes? You remember when they were saying that about Ronald Reagan, that his name was 666, all this, all this kind of stuff. Okay, I have no problem. If the Lord wants to come back right now, I'm, I'm there. How about you? It's like, yeah, bring it on. Uh, and I'm, I'm all about being excited about his imminent return and man, let's go be with the Lord. I am so ready. You know how many times I've said, Lord, I am so ready to go. But when I talk about ready to go, I'm ready for the church to go. I, I'm ready, Lord. It's just like, but you know, it's not his time yet. I want it to be cause I'm being selfish. You know, I, I just want to go be with him. Uh, and I know you do too. But the scripture also tells us as far as these signs are going on, 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, that's what John was saying in his day. Okay? So this has been going on for a long time. And as I stated, signs are important, but I don't believe Jesus wants to be focusing on the signs. He wants us to to be focused on the sun. So, in review, for the Jew, the temple they beheld was seen at this particular time as they're talking to Jesus. The temple they beheld was seen as Israel's identification. Master, Rabbi, look at the temple. Look at the stones. Isn't it beautiful? That was their identification. And they really felt... And they really thought this was it, just like you and I would. They felt, secondly, it was God's verification, that God was verifying that the millennial kingdom is coming in and all the nations coming into it, Isaiah 2, 2. It was scriptural confirmation. And by looking at the signs, they were coming up with their own conclusions that this must be it. They were all convinced, including the disciples. They were convinced that this was the time. Well, it was, but in a different sense. Because Jesus was saying, well, John the Baptist, he's the Elijah to come. Okay, this must be it then. But again, they didn't understand two comings. They were trying to figure that out. There are going to be two messiahs, one that dies and one that comes in on the horse and defeats the Romans. They really didn't know. And it's the same thing with you and I. We're doing a lot of guesswork, a lot of guess books and a lot of ideas. Well, could this be it? Could this be it? And I think it's exciting to get turned on about the signs of the times that we're living in, but not to start making predictions about them. I think that's, I think 
as the disciples were being completely thrown off at this time. Because you remember, by Acts chapter 1, Jesus is risen, and they're going, okay, this is it, right? Jesus is sitting with them, teaching them for 40 days. Okay, this is right. The kingdom of God is coming, right? And Jesus says, I want you to go into Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Well, teacher, you know, like a kid, uh, when's the kingdom coming? When are you going to restore the kingdom? They, they probably thought at that very moment it was going to happen. And he goes, well, that's not for you to know. That's, that's for my father. You guys, don't worry about it. You just go wait for the promise of the father. And they went into Jerusalem, and you know the story. The Holy Spirit came down. Well, they were wrong in their prediction. They saw the signs, and they thought, this is it. This is the millennial kingdom is going to come. And in a sense, the kingdom of God was not a physical place it was a spiritual place the kingdom of god is near you the kingdom of god is the holy spirit living within the believer righteousness okay and joy of the holy spirit paul will say the kingdom of god but that doesn't mean a literal kingdom of god is not coming but these are the things that god eventually shows like one of the first things i think i'll say when i get to heaven is not like oh i'm glad i made it but oh like, I'm going to know, oh, oh, okay, I get it now. Lord, you are so, you know, it's like you, everything will be corrected in your mind. You'll have the full uh, understanding of what God was trying to do. And you'll just go, oh, I missed it. Oh, you know, it's just going to be one big letter O. And, and Sharon, you know about that letter, don't you? I have to tease Sharon because she sees me. Uh, running back and forth and going back and forth. And, and she'll go, hey, Jeff, I need you to sign something. And oh, one more thing before I'm heading out the door. Oh, so I kind of tease her about the letter O, you know. But, but in reality, when we come into his presence, guys, we're going to know him as, he, as we are known. We're going to know as we are known. And we're going to understand everything at that point. Okay, so... I believe the stage is being set for his imminent return. But Paul said this, and this is why it's funny. You ever see those pictures of, of the rapture and people floating in the sky, you know, like, you know, beam me up, Scotty. Well, first of all, that's not how the rapture is going to happen. You're going to blink your eye and you're there. Okay? Boop, that's it. You're not, there's going to be no preparation for it. You're going to blink your eye and in a twinkling of an eye, you're going to be changed. Wow, you know. So you're not going to be ready for it. When are you going to be ready for it? That's why Jesus said, watch. Keep your eyes open. Keep fellowshipping with me. Watch what's going on. Stay busy about the kingdom. Just don't fall asleep. And we'll talk about that in the end if we get to it, if I shut up and get moving here. Okay, so... This idea of in a moment and twinkling of an eye will all be changed. I am not too sure if the last trump of God was meant to refer to our president. Okay. I've, I've actually heard that. The last trump at the last trump. He shall, he shall return, you know. But see, this is the kind of crazy stuff that goes on. So real quickly, we're going to run through. We, I think we hit about six of the signs. Uh, that started in the times of Jesus, in the times of the early church, and have been going. But as we talked about last week, if you're going to Medford, the signs to Medford from here are pretty, they're not too many. But the closer you get to Medford, you start seeing many, many signs with greater rapidity. And so the first thing that Jesus talked about was deception. And this has been ongoing. There's been deception from, from the Gnostics, to the, to the coming times the, uh, of our day. Then secondly, trepidation or anxiety. People have been stressed out since day one, always, okay? There's been persecution. And we talked about how this particular persecution, Jesus was referring to what happened in the book of Acts. And we covered that, how much of that persecution would be going on. Global evangelization number four. 
And we talked about it wasn't like Jesus wasn't depending on just the church to share the gospel because we read in Roman, uh, Revelation 14, 6 that an angel is going to procl be proclaiming the everlasting gospel. The thing is, is Jesus and God, God, they don't need us, okay? They want us. They want us to be, you know, God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, they want us to be involved in what he wants to do. But he's not depending on me. You see what I'm saying? It's a big difference. He wants to use me by his grace if I'm willing. Global evangelization will take place. And then continued persecution. This is ongoing, especially with the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism, as you know, is rising. And we still have all kinds of nations, save the United States of America, at this particular juncture, that want to wipe Israel off the map. That's ongoing persecution. And then we kind of camped on temple desolation, and I want to do that for just a little bit more. This idea of when he goes, when you see, future tense, when you see the abomination of desolation coming forth, when you see it going on, then you book it, okay? This is called then number six, temple desolation, okay? Now, you guys who have read enough in regards to Bible prophecy, we know this is the halfway point into the tribulation, according to Daniel 9. But in order for this prophecy that Jesus said, there has to be a temple. Okay? And there isn't a temple yet, but there's a lot of talk about one. Kathy, can you give us any update of what's going on at Temple Institute? No? Okay. Because the... Temple Institute, as far as I know, has everything uh, built, uh, the robes done. Uh, even, they even have a red heifer, as I understand. So all kinds of stuff is going on. But the temple has to be rebuilt. And, uh, and so it's only a matter of time. And so in that day, when the born-again Jews read this passage, Jesus is warning them, guys, when you see the abomination of desolation, it doesn't say run in the purple mountains of majesty, but runs, run into the mountains of Judea. Okay? Didn't write, like, run. He was specifically speaking to these Jewish men saying, the, 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 with the Jewish mindset, run into Judea, run into the mountains of Judea. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Get out of there, book it, split, don't delay, run for the hills. And last week we saw a video that explains the holdup. The holdup, the requirement may apply only to the majority of Jewish, the Jewish nation that is residing in Israel because there's still pockets of Jews all around the world, even though there are record amounts of Jews coming back to the land. There is a regathering going on. Pretty exciting. There's a huge burst in the late 90s, and I'm, I'm sure it's continuing to, to, to go. And I remember for the longest time, they thought there were 6 million Jews in New York City. And, uh, and uh, Israel has exceeded that now, has exceeded New York City. But there's still, the reason they're not want to build the temple is because a majority of Jew the Jewish nation isn't there yet. And so here's the thing. What, what their understanding is, is that right now where a lot of Jews are, they're living very comfortably. And listen, they say it would take something very negative and tragic to drive them out, to drive them out of their comfort and go to Israel. And in my opinion, that's where the rapture comes in. Because you take the church out, you're going to have instant chaos and mayhem and fear like you wouldn't believe. I believe the rapture has to happen in order for this chaos to stir fears. You guys remember 9-11. The churches were packed. Were they not? Seeking God. It's like because suddenly they were shook to the core and they packed into churches going, oh, is this it? Is this the end? Well, can you imagine a few billion people disappearing off the face of the earth? Hello? That would be really fearful. So these kinds of fears and the fact that anti-Semitism is rising, suddenly Israel is going to feel very, very vulnerable. And such a disappearance will produce such mass chaos and a desire, a desire which we're already seeing in our culture today of global unity and security. And Paul said, watch out when they start saying peace and safety. Okay. 
I believe this will put a total focus on Israel. The rapture, I believe, this is just my own opinion. I'm not making any declarations here, but I believe that the rapture will force Jews to say, we've got to get with our people. We've got to get back to Israel. We've got, we, we don't, we're not safe here anymore. And they'll go to a place where God promised to protect them. Okay? And leading to revival, of course, I think this will lead to revival. I believe this will lead to mass salvation of the jewish people and uh, mass revival going on and that's where they will they will begin to say this is it we know now this is it the the messiah is coming back and we're going to go out and it doesn't specifically say that jews will go out and evangelize but why wouldn't they why wouldn't they as far as if they've become born again believers and now they know messiah is coming back they would just go ballistic and start sharing with the brothers and the sisters and first with all the Jewish people. And so that's going to take place. And who knows how the world is going to explain this phenomena of the rapture. You've heard a few explanations like UFOs are going to zap the Christians. Have you heard that one? And at Mount Shasta, they actually have this prayer group of New Agers who really believe that aliens are going to come and take the Christians away. Okay, this is happening in our day now. Uh, maybe the is uh, the Islam faith will believe that the that Allah destroyed the infidels. Okay, we we just we just don't know. But somehow the rapture will be explained away, and people are going to buy it hook, line, and sinker. And this is where we understand that in Daniel that this false Messiah is going to confirm a covenant. And you know how hungry people are for a charismatic. They don't care whether he's truthful or not. They're just looking for anybody who's charismatic to lead the charge. Okay. And this particular man will be the son of perdition. He will be Satan incarnate. He will be, but he will be suave and convincing and good looking and just he will have the best smile. He, he will have everything everyone longs for in a leader. Everything. And people will, he will go and the first thing he's going to do is confirm this covenant with Israel. And say, this has to happen. We see this going on right now with Trump trying to do some stuff there in Israel and all that. Every president has tried to do that. Well, this guy is going to do it. And it's going to succeed for a season. And they're going to go, oh, this must be part of the coming of the Messiah is here. Because I remember for years when I went the first time I went there, how do you know that the Messiah is going to be here? I would ask the Jews there and they say, he will build our temple. I went, oh, I got to chill down my back. I went, whoa, it's exactly what Daniel said. He's going to build the temple. He's going to make sure it happens and the Jews are going to love him for it. You know, this is the, the Messiah or whoever, whoever they might think he is. They're going, definitely going to be in love with this guy. He's also going to show all kinds of power, signs and lying wonders while mocking the God of heaven. And if possible, the Bible says to deceive the very elect. OK. Amazingly, this delusion will be sent to the unbelievers. Now, let me now this is where I'm going to just ask you if you I don't know if Nick got them up or not, but Second Thessalonians two, nine through twelve. Here's what it says. Again, this is part of the abomination of desolation and the uh, connective tissue of the scriptures to it. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Because they did not pass tense. In other words, they had a chance, but they didn't, so the Lord turned them over to a debased mind, Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> For this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie and that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So at this time, I don't know exactly how, you know, there's all kinds of opinions on that. But the idea is there's going to be this pseudo peace in Jerusalem for, for three and a half years. 
just an incredible lake. It's really coming down and there's peace and there's unity and there's globalism and there's just this big thing going on and the sacrifices are going to be reinstituted. And so after three and a half years though, he's going to go in. There has to be a rebuilt temple to do this so the temple will be rebuilt. This guy is going to stand in the Holy of Holies probably laced with cameras, flat screens. It's going to be snazzy. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be top-notch, high-tech, the whole deal. Probably streamlining 24-7. And he's going to put himself in that Holy of Holies and say, now worship me. I'm God. He's going to stand in the Holy of Holies demanding to be worshipped as God. And with all this charisma and charm, some people will. And then Jesus says, now when you see this, Jews, when you guys see this, run for it. Get out. Don't even worry about your clothes and pray that it's not on the Sabbath because all transportation is shut down. You'll get in your elevator and it'll stop at every floor. And you'll have to wait for it to shut again. Get out. Just go and start running toward Judea, to the hills of Judea, the mountains of Judea. Well, that's when Antichrist is going to suddenly turn on the Jewish people because the Jewish people will not do that. They were not going to bow to any man. They're not going to worship any man. They only worship God. Okay? The Hebrew Shema. Okay? So, Revelation 13 tells us, like, Something's going to happen, and we all know that shipping in our pets and all this stuff is in their embryonic stages right now. But in that day, all who dwell on the earth will worship this guy or will be forced to worship this guy. And Revelation 13 tells us he will cause all to receive a mark on their right hand or foreheads, and no one may buy or sell without his name. So if you don't get marked, you starve. And it's amazing what a hungry stomach will make you do. Okay? So, they tell us, it tells us, you know, we watched a little bit of that movie last week where this he, this guy's going to be high on himself because Satan wants to be worshipped. And he'll be using this man. He goes, I want you to worship my image. He'll set up some kind of image in the Holy of Holies. And uh, some some have suggested some kind of robotic image in the Holy of Holies. And those who refuse to worship it will be put to death. It's going to be forced. And listen, here's something that's really interesting. It says it in Daniel 7 and also Revelation 13. That he will make war with the saints and overcome them. The saints. Yeah, the saints. Daniel says it. Revelation 13 and it's dealing with the same time this could not refer to the church because Jesus said the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church different set of saints those who get saved after the church is taken up okay that's why Jesus said let him who reads understand okay so Jews I'm talking to you I'm telling you when you see run Okay, now where are they going to run? Okay, what I'm going to do is, can you show that video, uh, uh, Shirley? Okay, you guys all know what this place is, right? As you just look at this, I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 16, 1 through 5. It's pretty chilling to listen to. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah or Selah, which is rock, to the wilderness to the mount of the daughter of Zion, for it shall be as a wandering bird thrown out of the nest. So shall the daughters of Moab at the fords of Arnon. What's the daughters of Moab? Jordan. Take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day, hide the outcasts. Do not betray him who escapes. Now, this is God speaking. Let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab, or O Israel, or O Jordan. Let my people, let 
My outcasts dwell with you, for the extortioner is at an end. Devastation ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. In mercy, the throne will be established, and the one and one will sit on it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. Okay, so it's a, a prophetic word in regards to where the Jews are going to flee. And this is a very good possibility. They're going to go toward the Jordan. And believe me, if you've been to this place, it has, uh, what do they say, uh, about 102 square miles of stone caverns and caves to hide in. Now, here's the part that gets really crazy. This is where Satan is enraged with Israel because they won't worship him. And remember what he said in Isaiah 14, Satan himself, he goes, I will be like the most high God and you defy me, I'm going to kill you. Well, it tells us that two thirds of Israel will be cut off, one third left. I'll just read this from Zechariah 13, 9. God will bring forth the third through the fire. What's fire representing? Judgment or purification, okay? He will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested under the heat, okay? They will call on his name and God will answer them. So it appears the remaining Jews will escape to Petra, Jordan, uh, into these stones until the great tribulation period is over. And if you read in Revelation 12, the false Messiah, the Antichrist, is going to send down another army after the Jews, but the earth will open up and swallow the army that he sends. So God is going to protect them on the way. And you go, well, that's just crazy. Well, if you read about 1948 and what took place there in 1967, the Jews should have never won, but they did. Somebody but was behind the scenes, God himself. So I believe he will be there. Antichrist, at this particular juncture, when that fails, he's going to be so distracted with, with what's going on the earth that he's, he's just going to have too many other things to do at that particular juncture. God's going to keep him busy. But let me tell you something, guys. The carnage is going to be like none other war that has ever been fought. It is going to be the bloodiest, most destructive thing you could ever imagine, okay? So he says, J Jesus said in uh, Mark uh, 13, 19, and 20, for in those days there will be tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. So this is the worst it's ever going to get at this time and it will never be that way again. And unless the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh will be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Okay? So that's number seven, the great tribulation. Okay? The great tribulation. Now I'm going to go slow here because this great tribulation, there's a zillion scriptures on it, but I want to try to put this together to get us to understand when you're reading the book of Revelation and you're seeing the things that are going on, that there are other passages throughout Scripture. Remember, there are 813 references from the Old Testament in Revelation. Okay? The prophecies. Revelation is basically the fulfillment of everything that was spoken in Daniel, Zechariah, and in other passages in Isaiah and whatnot. But I just want to read a few of these to you that Revelation 11 through 19 foretells that the earth will be shaken to its core massive earthquakes, vast fires, smoke hovering for miles and miles and miles, blocking the sun, making it look red, okay? Perhaps due to the nuclear exchange. And why do I say that? Because listen to Zechariah 14, 12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongue shall dissolve in their mouths. Okay? But it's the Lord 
defending Jerusalem. Don't mess with my city, the Lord says. Now, it sounds nuclear to me, but all the radioactivity will obviously cause bizarre weather patterns, intense heat, drought, fires, and whatnot, electrical storms, blackouts. And guys, we are talking millions of people killed. Millions. In the millions. Millions and millions of people left dead. And no one to bury them. Just think of that. Now, I don't want you to think about it too long because it's like, dang, that's heavy. But this is, what's, this is what man would do to himself unless the Lord shortened those days. This is what man would do. He would destroy himself. Now, listen to what I, when I talk about this idea of this war in Israel and the dead needing to be buried. There's a very eerie prophecy in Ezekiel 39, 14 through 16. I'm just going to read it to you. They will be set apart. They, they will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it because you know that Jews can't touch dead bodies. So they're actually going to employ these people to bury them. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. So for seven months, they will search. Why? Because there won't be bodies. There will be bones. Okay. A nuclear blast will just. Pfft, ain't no flesh left. Okay. So they'll be looking for. Uh, all these bones. When anyone sees a man's bone. He will set up a marker by it. And the barriers have buried it. In the valley of Hamon Gog. Now is that. A. Uh, uh, Kathy, help me on that. Where, where is that at? Is that near Megiddo? Yes. The, the name of the city will also be Hamona. Thus they shall cleanse the land. So I think this is, this is the area. That look, well, that's, I don't know. Is that around where Megiddo is? I didn't have time to, to look that up. But the, the, the idea is that you can see this is going to be a massive destruction uh, and it's going to, going to take seven months to find the bones to find the dead and get them buried and cleanse the land that's all i know and the lord will have to stop this destruction at some point to save the elect surviving on the earth now again when we talk about elect we talked about this last week the elect is a term ascribed to three groups Israel, mine elect, that's what God said. The church is the elect of God, and it's gone at this point, and those saved during the tribulation, okay? Jews and Gentiles, okay? So then, after he says this, unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened those days, verse 21. Then, now this is during this time, I'll tell you, corrupt man never stops. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, he's there, don't believe it, okay? For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed, see, I have told you all things beforehand. And so number seven was great tribulation. Number eight, loving admonition. Jesus is lovingly warning as he tells us all in advance to beware of the date setting and the Messiah-like personalities. Watch out. I've told you beforehand. Now, one of the things that I didn't get to last week was Jesus said, watch out for this. This has been happening since Jesus. And is it, if I'm not mistaken, Jesus is the first one. He used the term false Christs. And it wasn't until after he died and rose again that suddenly people were saying they were the Christ. Not beforehand. They called themselves prophets. But once Jesus died and rose again, now we have false Christs. We have pseudo-Christs. Well, watch out because you can deceive people. Well, this is what happened to a man named William Miller. William Miller in 1843 
or uh, it's when he began to figure it out, at least what he was interpreting uh, the book of Daniel. He took the 2,550 days foretold about this abomination and desolation, and he made them into years, even though the scripture said they were days. He made them into years, and somehow he translated the days into years, leading to October 11th, 1844. Again, a date setting. And he believed that when the abomination of desolation took place, that's when he thought it was going to take place, was at that particular time. But he didn't bother to look at history to realize that those were literal days when Judas Maccabeus came and he cleansed the temple and that prophecy was fulfilled by the day and not the year. Okay? So Jesus said, watch out for these guys who say they have their date setting or these false Christs or false prophets that come around. and uh, But Miller was so sure of this. Can you imagine the embarrassment? He had all his followers, some 50,000. I don't know how many were there, but they all sat on the hill of Mount Zion, Illinois, on October 11th in their white robes and waited for Jesus to return on that day. Can you imagine? You're just sitting there. And as the sun goes down, you feel like a complete dweeb. And that group dismantled. But it's interesting what happened from that group. You see, there was a gal who had another special insight that it wasn't the abomination. It was actually called investigative judgment. And her name, Ellen G. White. Now, this is what's interesting because the very birth of the Seventh-day Adventist movement is based on failed prophecy. Adventism, Advent, that's why their focus is on end times. But this investigate, how many have heard of investigative judgment before? Okay. What it is, I'll try to, uh, try to explain this uh, and not get too much into it, but I'll take something that she wrote uh, what it is. She said, as the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lies of all who believed on Jesus come and review before God. Now, keep in mind, she is not believing in the finished walk, work of Jesus Christ. He's focused on, you be good person here. You be good because your sins are being listed and you're going to be investigated when you die. So this is the whole idea. Beginning with those who first lived on the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name mentioned, every case closely investigated. Names are accepted, names are rejected. Can you imagine the fear upon Seventh-day Adventists when they realize, I could go to hell. I better keep the Sabbath. I better keep the law. I better do what's right. I better listen to those in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. I better read Ellen G. White's books, The Great Controversy. I better read all that stuff because I don't want to go to hell. Can you believe the fear that these poor people have been under? And there are some fine people in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Randy, you guys remember Randy? Yeah, was Randy, uh, I won't say his name. Randy, he was just a, just a he used to live, uh, be one of my neighbors. Just an incredibly good brother. He didn't go, Jeff, I don't go for all that. And I go, good for you. But the thing is, is they're in that movement. If you want to be a part of that leadership, man, it's, you got to hold to that investigative judgment. And I have heard testimonies of these people who have gotten out of that movement. And they go, you don't know how scared I was. If I had died, I thought I was going to hell. Because, because I, you know, I missed the Sabbath. I, I didn't, you know, and they're just so tied up on the Sabbath day thing that they were bound up. So many, many good people, but it's really sad to hear the fear that they had, even though they, well, you begin to find out that many of them didn't, were not born again believers. They just signed up to be seventh day Adventists. And that meant they were saved just like I'll be a Catholic or I'll be a Methodist. But there was no born again experience because these people said when they got out of it and they, they yielded to Jesus Christ. Suddenly they were what? Liberated and free and regenerated. My sins are forgiven. 
So for them to come to that conclusion before or after the Seventh Day Adventist experience tells me they weren't born again to begin with. They just signed up to a religion that didn't deliver. And they are manipulated by the fear of diet and all the rest. And it's really a sad deal. So Jesus lovingly admonished and he goes, guys, take heed. I've told you all these things. Watch out for these false prophets. They're going to say it sound pretty convincing. And I will say, following the abomination of just, uh, desolation, by the way, Jews will know when Jesus returns. They will know. 1260 days. Okay, we don't know the day or the hour, and we couldn't. But if we were there at the halfway point, and we saw the abomination, we would know when Jesus is returning. Okay, so that doesn't wash for me as far as the church being there. Verse 24, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The smoke and whatnot, stars of heaven will fall, meteorites will shower the earth and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So number nine, you see absolute destruction. Absolute destruction. Jesus may be referring to Joel 3, 14 and 15, which says this. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord, which is not the rapture. The day of the Lord is the coming of the Lord. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Where's that? Megiddo. Okay. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. Peter affirms this in Acts 2.20 and in Revelation 6.12 under the sixth seal. And I'll read that to you. I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake. And when the Bible says great, it's huge. Okay, it's huger than we could ever imagine. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood. Okay. Revelation tells us that hailstones the size of basketballs will plummet the earth. 75 pounds, the weight of a talent. Will fall to the. Can you imagine the? You've seen where their golf ball says, and they just pellet the daylights out of uh, the poor used car lots. You know they get nailed every time. You know, but we're talking. These things are going to be coming down. You're going to feel the earth. Just well, we won't, but they will. It's going to be something. But then, as that is taking place, verse 26 says, "And they doesn't say you, does it? They." will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory. The, the, the kabod, the glory, the power. And he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. And number 10 is the final congregation. And this is where the sheep and all that and the goats will be separated and all that. This is the actual second coming of Christ. The rapture is not the second coming because Jesus doesn't come to the earth. He meets us halfway and takes us home. What a day it's going to be. That's why the Bible calls it a snatching away, a catching away. He's not going to come to the earth. We're going to be up like that in a twinkling of an eye. Just think of that, guys. One day, we're going to blink our eyes and be there. That's how fast it's going to be. No beat me up stuff. It's going to be, oh, wow, yeah. You know, just can you imagine? Peter John um, had, Peter John and John Corson's son uh, died on the table and he felt like he had this vision of heaven. And he goes, I didn't see anything. I could only hear voices. I heard my mom who, who's in heaven. I heard my sister who's in heaven. And he goes, I, I can't explain it. It felt like I was there for hours. He was only out for like two minutes or something. But he goes, it felt like I was there for hours. And, and, uh, and it's just a fabulous book to read because it's very short. But he goes, all I can tell you is heaven's fun. It was just fun. Everything about it, we were rejoicing. We were excited. He goes, I, I couldn't really see much of anything. I, I didn't see any faces. You know, Jesus didn't come up to me and say that all religions lead to heaven. You know, 
all the stuff that you hear on DSA. He goes, it was just fun. There was celebration. There was dancing. There was just, everyone was just going, you know, it was just fun. He goes, that's all the only way I can describe it. It was just fun. Heaven's going to be fun. We're going to have a great time. And suddenly when we blink our eye, we're going to be there. And guys, have you ever seen the end of a World Series? You know, when you saw the Cubs win the World Series last year, all the hand, I mean, everyone was jumping up, even the people in the stands and everyone was jumping up and down. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get to heaven? It's, like, it's here, yeah! I mean, oh, wow, what a party it's going to be. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, they're going to see, it doesn't matter whether they know or not, they're just going to see the clouds of glory and they're going to see Jesus coming down. And by the way, Revelation 19 tells us, you and I will be with him. And I, and I want to read that. Thank you for bringing that up because it says here, this is out of Zechariah 14 through 5, and I want to read it to you because this is huge. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken. The houses rifled. The women ravished. Remember when the abomination desolation takes place. And, and But this is coming near the end. Half of the city shall go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. As he fights in the day of battle. And, and the Lord's a pretty good fighter. And in that day, oh, I love this part. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move to the north and half of it toward the south. I mean, it's just going to open up. If you've been there on the Mount of Olives, just imagine the whole thing just opening up. Now, listen, then he goes, then you shall flee through my mountain valley, I'll bet. For the mountain valley shall reach to Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Thus, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. That's us. All the saints, then some of the saints, all the saints with you. And this is correlated perfectly with Revelation 19. Uh, boy, I just, ooh, I get so excited about that. Because this stuff's really going to happen. This is stuff, and we're going we're gonna to see the whole thing. The Mount of Olives. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard the story, but you know that Jesus is going to, as Messiah, is going to walk according to, I think, Ezekiel 34, going to walk through the Golden Gate. But it's blocked right now, and it's meant to be blocked until he returns. And I just heard this story, and I think it's kind of cool, because, you know, with an earthquake, what happens? The earth is being pushed up. Well, the temple mount, <laughs> this is cool, the actual temple that Jesus was uh, teaching in is underneath the temple that we see now. Because, remember, it was... In, it was, uh, it was uh, buried in the rubble, and then they rebuilt it, but underneath is the actual golden gate. Because one time, a Muslim who was working in the, uh, in the graveyard site, because it's all big graveyard cemetery, fell through a hole and saw the old gate. The old golden gate that's underneath the actual gate that we see now. So the concept is that during the earthquake, here comes and all of a sudden the old temple the al-aqsa mosque all that just rolls right off and here comes the original golden gate as jesus goes through that gate yeah that's gonna be great that's gonna be fantastic so that's a very good possibility that's a very good possibility but that's why he goes guys Verse 28, now learn this parable from the fig tree. 
when its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, let me add this tag in Luke 21, 29 through 30. He adds this. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. Okay? When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. You, so you also, when you see these things happening, it's at the doors, verse 30, as surely I say to you, this generation, that is that generation that witnesses these things will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but guys, what I say, I mean, is what he's saying. It will not pass. So this is a message, number 11, to future generations. Now, I know we've all heard this concept of the fig tree sprouting as Israel becoming a nation in 1948. But why in the world would Jesus say that the disciples wouldn't get that? They wouldn't understand that. And that's why I think Luke makes it very clear. He goes, you guys, you live in Israel. You see when the fig trees, you can tell when they're starting to sprout because everything is really, you know what it's like. You start noticing little sprouts coming out of the trees. Well, the figs are pretty pronounced when they start you, so, so in history, but he goes in all the trees. Just look at all the trees. You can tell summer's coming. It's a sign. We don't want to read into any of that. Watching the fig tree was just a common sight in Israel, but in other nations as well, because trees depicts nations in Scripture. Oftentimes, speaks of nations. Look at Israel. Look at all the other nations as well. As you begin to see the sprouting, when you begin to see all these uh, things going on, it indicates, what does spring indicate? It indicates resurrection. It indicates newness of life coming after the cold hearts and bleak winter of the tribulation. When we begin to see these things happen in the present, they're going to be an indication of what's coming in the future. Now, right now we're going, it's supposed to be summer. It's really green and and it's like, okay, you don't have to sprout anymore. It's supposed to come. And so it's fooling us because it's supposed to be summer, but it's acting like it's still spring. But that's not how this is going to happen. But this is what Jesus said. He makes this clear. He goes, look, heaven and earth pass away. My words are not going to pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the son, but only the father. Now, Jesus didn't know. Well, understand, Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus laid aside his deity, okay? And so he was no longer as a man. He was a man, fully man, fully God. So he chose to lay aside his ability to know those things. Now, how many know he probably does now? Seated at the right hand of the Father. He probably knows the day or the hour now. But as a man at this particular juncture, no. And uh, because here's a, here's a couple of uh, things. Remember when he went to the fig tree? He was fooled. He thought there was fruit on it and there wasn't. Well, if he was all knowing as a man, then why would he be fooled by that? What about the time when he's in the crowd and uh, the woman touches his garment? He's in the middle of the crowd and they go, who touched me? I feel virtues come out of me. Powers come out of me. So he he didn't know who it was. So he chose to put that aside as a man. And uh, but as he's glorified, I'm sure that that's no longer the case. I think he knows the day he's just waiting for dad to say, go get him, son. Go get your bride. Verse 33. Take heed. Watch and pray for you don't know when the time is. He didn't say figure it out. He didn't say take a guess. He didn't say date set. But he said, take heed, take notice Watch or observe and keep talking to the Father. Keep in prayer. Stay in communication with the Lord. And I'm really finding it's interesting in our culture, um, the temptation to stay busy and distracted from prayer is getting easier and easier. You can do so many other things. You can do so many other things. And uh, And he's going, hey, just... Keep watching. Now, watch this now. Not only keep watch and pray, but go to work. Be about work, verse 34. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his what? Servants. What do servants do? They serve. 
They work, okay? Not to be saved, but they do it because they've been given authority to serve the master and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. I want to give that verse to our doorkeepers. Commanded the doorkeeper to watch, verse 35. Watch therefore, for you don't know when the master of the house is coming. So keep an eye out in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, you never know. So the whole concept is, he goes, lest he finally, uh, he suddenly find you sleeping. Now, do you think the Lord's going to come back and go, oh, Al and I, he's sleeping, I'm going to surprise him. What's Jesus saying here? He finishes it by saying, I say to you all to you, watch. Just keep watching. Don't get focused on your failures. Don't get focused on all your woes. Don't get focused on all your anxieties. Don't get focused on all the troubles that are going on in the world. Don't focus on the signs. Focus on the sun. Don't do it. Don't get all focused on the weariness of this life. And I know how easy it is for us to do this. But he goes, just stay alert. Just keep waiting. I'm coming. Just watch. You see it. You know it. You feel it in your heart instinctively. You know it. You see the signs. But you're not trying to figure it out. You're just going, Jesus, man, I just want to keep myself. And so for some of us, you might be saying, the Lord might be challenging you to say, hey, spend more time with me. Go for a walk. Uh, uh, get up 15 minutes early. I want to spend time with you. Read before you go to bed. Whatever it is the Lord might be telling you to do. But if you're feeling that in your heart, that's not legalism, folks. That's the Lord saying, be busy about watching and praying and get excited about what the future holds for you. Because I'm telling you guys, it's going to be something. We're going to do more oohs and ahs than any July 4th parade we ever saw. And we're going to watch Jesus do it. Riding on our white horses. It's so great. When I first, when I read that, my daughter asked for a horse. And uh, she goes, what do you want, Selena? Pray, for, pray what you want. She goes, well, Daddy, I want a horse. I went, oh, man, big mouth. We were on 16th Street, and uh, we got a house over on Carmen Lane, and it was a, a, a trailer up there, and uh, well, we moved up there, and it just so happened to be Joni Boyd's sister, Penny, and guess what was there? A horse, and Selena got to feed it and take care of it. Go, see, honey, the Lord answered your prayer. He can give you a horse, but you had time to play with one. But then later on, she did get a horse. But you see what I'm saying? But I was telling her, I said, hey, look at this, Selena. White horses. We're going to be riding in on white horses with Jesus. And we're going to see the whole thing coming through the clouds, seeing the smoke and the devastation, and Jesus coming and raining vengeance upon the enemies. Oh, we're going to see it all with perfect 1515 vision and a perfect brain. I mean, just think about it. It's, it's crazy. I mean, it's awesome what it's going to be like. And we're going to see it all. And Jesus go through that golden gate. We're going to be cheering. I mean, the applause and the cheering is going to be deafening. And our ears aren't going to ring afterwards. There'll be glorified ears. I mean, just everything will just be absolutely perfect. So that's why finally, number 12, pay attention. The New Testament is laced, by the way. You know when we talk about when the Bible repeats itself, we should probably listen. Now, I, I'm just going to read these to you because these are all passages that tell us to watch and then we'll have communion together. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Ephesians six eighteen. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance. That means you got to keep going. Supplication for all the saints. So we pray for each other. First Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. First Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And then finally, Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. 
Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Precious saints, I am convinced if we do what Jesus said, we won't be swayed by some new book coming out about end times. But we'll be encouraged. I'm not saying you shouldn't read them. I'm just saying always read them and say, you know, this is just a man's opinion on something. But the bottom line is, does it make me want to hang out with the sun or just seek more signs? To hunger for more signs? Because we know that the nation of Israel saw the signs. And why did they not enter into the promised land? Because of unbelief. Signs do not produce faith. The sun produces faith. And that is what we need more than anything. So, Father, thank you for the words of your son. Thank you that you have it all figured out, that you are going to do the work and we are going to be a part of it. And how are you are going to do it? We know not how. We don't know how you're going to do it. We have our ideas. We have our opinions. We have our guesstimates. There are all these books that say it's going to be this. It's going to be that. And if it does happen, great, Lord. We'll rejoice in it. But the bottom line is, Lord, we just want to keep our eyes on you. Just be engrossed in your grace, growing in grace, being busy about your work, being busy about the Father's business, being busy about sharing the gospel, loving people, just so excited, Lord. And I just pray for us as people that you would reignite the reality of your soon return. Lord, in every generation, those who lived thinking that you were going to return at any moment lived a holy life. They lived a life where they were ready. And I think that's healthy for us as well. So Lord, help us, as you said here, to be ready so that when you do come, Lord, whether we're rubbing our eyes, we will see uh, the, the time approaching and, and we'll have ourselves ready waiting for you to come as you continue to show us through the signs in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's grab the, the elements are right there. And uh, why, why don't everybody grab uh, your elements and we'll share communion together. Hey, Nick, I was never plugged in, was I? <laughs> I was wondering why it sounded so dead.